Good afternoon, and welcome to the Ethanol Producer Magazine webinar series. My name is Lisa Gibson. I'm the Managing Editor of Ethanol Producer Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's webinar, Diversifying Revenue Through Protein Co-Products, sponsored by FluidQuip Process Technologies. Before we get started, here's a quick word from our sponsor. FluidQuip Process Technologies provides custom technology, engineering, and project solutions to the dry grind ethanol and biochemical industries around the world. These include full plant design, process optimization studies, yield improvement technologies, new co-product technologies, and turnkey capital projects. FluidQuip Process Technologies leadership team has been developing novel technologies and process solutions for the biofuels and biochemical markets for more than 25 years. Their technical team of accomplished chemical and mechanical engineers and experienced project and construction managers are ready to take your project from concept to startup. FluidQuip Process Technologies, let's get started. Thank you to FluidQuip for sponsoring today. I do have a few details I'd like to go through before I introduce our speakers. First, today's webinar is being recorded. You'll be able to find it at ethanolproducer.com under the events tab, so check for that within the next week or so. And second, we will take questions at the end of today's webinar after all three speakers have delivered their presentations, but you can submit a question at any time using the question submission box on your screen. If you'd like your question directed to a specific panelist, please indicate that. And any questions that aren't addressed during the Q&A segment today will be forwarded to panelists, along with the contact information of the attendees who asked them. So the panelists will still be able to answer any questions that come up today about their presentations. And with that, we're ready to begin. We have three speakers on our panel today. First is Neil Jekyll. He's the Vice President of Strategy and Development for Fluid Quip, Quip Process Technologies. Then we'll have Scott Tilton, who's the Manager of Nutrition Services for Flint Hills Resources, and John Quick, President of Fluid Quip Process Technologies. Neil is presenting first today, so Neil, go ahead and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate the opportunity today to present and talk through some unique characteristics of the technology that uh, we'll be talking about, the MSC, as well as a little bit background in terms of the global markets regarding protein and what's happening out there. First, uh, oh, I thought I had it here. There we go. Oh, wrong direction, as, as usual. Um, first, I'd like to talk through diversifying revenue and what that really looks like uh, from, a, from an ethanol plant. What we're trying to achieve here is moving away from really legislative uh, backed revenue stream really to market driven revenue stream. And what that is, what that's driving towards is really the increased demand in protein or the increased demand for animal feed consisting of vegetable based protein, not meat based protein, and also the endless market opportunity we have moving forward. Lisa, can you advance the slide? It's not. One more, please. It wasn't there working there for a second. Sorry, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Lisa. All right, real quick on the background of Maximize Stillage Co-Product or MSC. What this is, is really this is a high protein separated from the back end of the ethanol process. It consists of the corn protein as well as the yeast that is produced within the process. It's a 50% protein. It is uh, patented uh, and commercially been running for more than eight years now. We have the system up and running in three facilities, two in the U.S., one in Brazil. We have one under construction, which is the Flint Hills project out in Fairmont, Nebraska, as well as we have several more in engineering. We have completed extensive feeding trials and product development work on this product. We've completed an excess of 20 plus feeding trials, and Scott will talk a little bit more about those details here in, here in the next presentation. It is the only commercially proven high protein purity product in the marketplace today. And that's a big differentiator out there is given there's a lot of noise around protein lately, this is really the only one that's, that's been up and running commercially proven both on the technology side as well as the market demand market pricing side, side as well. 
We're looking at realistically great returns on investments on a fully invested project. You're looking at less than three years return. That's at proven meal values today. And upwards, some of the larger plants, we're looking at 20 to $25 million of incremental EBITDA to the bottom line. So, and these again are based on proven, uh, proven meal values, proven uh, technology throughput gains, as well as, uh, as well as the overall efficiency gain within the plant, which John will talk more about late uh, here in a little bit. There we go. All right, so a couple of quotes here. Um, uh, Rabobank and others around the world have been looking at protein for a while now in terms of what's going on. And the real, the real point here is there is a scarcity of high quality, high digestible, high value proteins that's needed for the growing, the growing population globally, not just here in the US, but worldwide. So when we look at this, there's really this huge shift of moving towards vegetable based proteins and away from animal based proteins, right? We all remember the, uh, the uh, mad cow disease uh, over in Europe a while back, and that really has stemmed a lot of the transition to move away from, from, from utilizing uh, animal byproducts and feed rations to really moving to healthier, better choice vegetable based proteins. Some of the biggest things out there as we see, and the other big thing is I think the recognition of this drive, of this demand for protein is underappreciated by a lot of the big ag food businesses, feeding companies, agricultural producers globally. So not just a U.S. demand, but a global, global demand. When you look at, when you look, one of the things I want to talk about is, is uniqueness about this MSC process and the Still Pro 50 product from a positioning point of view, right? When you look at grains and, and not just proteins, but grains and feed ingredients as a whole, right? You have this, this dichotomy of volume versus value, right? High volume, low, low price, low volume, high price scenario. And when you look at the base commodities out there, so grains, corn, wheat, things like that, DDGS, right? Abundance of those products globally don't really have a lot of value to them. When you start moving up that curve, up that protein uh, purity level, right? You get into soybean meal, corn gluten meal, right? The value starts driving up, but the volume starts driving down. Really, there's, and then you jump up to the top, which is really the additives. Those are your minerals, your, your nutrient, your micronutrients. These are things that are added at, you know, a quarter percent, one percent into a feed ration, right? Very small volume, very high value. What we're getting into really is this growth of what we call this alternative protein market, which is really taking those, those commodity based proteins and enhancing them, adding value to them to make them more valuable and more meaningful to the, to the actual species. All right, a couple key things on markets, right, in terms of what's driving. What are the drives for this protein when we look at global demand, what's going out there? Biggest thing is the, the compound annual growth rate for these protein ingredients, both North America, Western Europe, 5-plus percent in, each, in those markets, 4% in Europe. Asia is, is well over 7% growth, all right? Lots of mouths to feed. People are moving up the uh, income chain. They want more. Uh, they want higher nutrient value. They want healthier foods. It's coming. That's all really coming from the protein, from the from the vegetable protein route. When you look at product trends, really, and the other key thing there is um, the the use of those are growing much more rapid than the than the use of of other meat based proteins. Right, soybean meal today is the dominant protein out there between North America, South America, China. Um, it's the dominant choice today, but there are limitations, especially as you get into certain feed rations due to some anti-nutritional, as well as some global um, gl- global challenges that continue to grow more and more soybean meal. Right. Um, the other key thing is the fortification of food. So not just vegetable proteins going and used to, to to grow animals but vegetable proteins going into foods to, to, to add functionality and fortify those foods. So, and tied to all that really is a consumer change, right? The consumer attitude continues to drive the demand for healthier foods, uh, healthier choices, and vegetable proteins are really looked look at that. Also healthier meat choices. So moving away from some of the rumen type base rations, more to the healthier aquaculture, shrimp, uh, fish options. The other big thing we see there too is is just the perception of not just healthier but safer as well from a animal-based protein, 
right? There's companies out there today, like Impossible Foods, right, where they have a fake hamburger. It looks and feels like a real beef hamburger, but it's all made up of, of ingredients that consist of pretty much all vegetable uh, components, whether that's vegetable-based protein or vegetable oils. So it, it is a trend that continues to drive and continues to increase moving forward. All right, so where are all these proteins going to come from? We talked about the demand. We talked about some of the global changes going on. When we look back over the last 20 years, right, there's been a substantial increase in the protein-based crops being produced out there. And that's mainly really come from a lot of soybeans, a little bit sunflower, a little bit rapeseed, but mainly driven from really the, the, the soybean growth globally. And there are challenges with that, as we talked about, there's certain limitations of soybean meal into certain rations. We also then look at that bottom curve, at the bottom of the blue line there, that talks about, that's really the energy crop. Really the, what's, what we see going forward, and that's uniqueness about the technology, is for that energy crops really to become more integrated and really become a protein crop and a protein source by utilizing technologies like the MSC to basically concentrate and separate those proteins and differentiate that protein stream from others. For example, corn-based protein actually is a lot, has a lot more uh, nutrient uh, characteristics over soybean meal and actually can be adapted into wider feed rations globally versus soybean meal because the soybean meal has certain trypsin inhibitors and things like that. All right, so now let's look at the big picture, right? When we look at just from a global meat or global protein demand, right, and, and projecting forward, when you look at the blue line, the bottom line, that's the, that's the uh, beef global or ruminant global, right? Here back a couple years, the, the aquaculture market surpassed that as number three in terms of global meat production. What's still the two big ones, which are poultry at the top and, and uh, pork, and mo mostly that's driven by the Southeast Asia market. Those are two dominant feeds, but aquaculture continues to grow at a higher growth rate from, a, from, a, from an inclusion into the, feed, into the food ration moving forward. So what does that mean? When you really look at the uh, next slide here, it talks about the actual inclusion. So as we continue to demand or it continue to, to seek the, the, the production increases of beef and pork, and poultry, things like that, what we've seen a shift here in the last 20 years, roughly last 15 to 20 years, and projected going forward for the next five to 10 years, is a continued migration towards improving and increasing the use of vegetable-based proteins from into the feed ration. So we've seen roughly a 2x increase over the last 15 years of that demand, hence reasons why some of the crop productions have increased as well in the, previ in the previous slide. So now we want to talk about what I love about this slide is it really shows as, as that the, the previous or, or two slides back where we talked about the global growth of pork and poultry and fish and cattle. The unique thing is all those are different, right, in a sense of how they utilize protein, how they incorporate protein into the feed ration. What this slide is showing is that the cattle use the least amount of protein all right, in terms, in terms of gain of feed in to mass out. Whereas fish, in this case salmon, use a lot of protein and they basically have a much higher feed to conversion rate. So protein in almost equals protein out essentially, right? So as the demand for that pork, pork and chicken and salmon continue to outpace and outgrow all other species, the demand for protein to go into those feed rations and more specifically the demand for vegetable-based proteins continues to drive that significant demand long term. And that's really what it's, it, what, what's exciting is there is demand. There is unlimited demand of, of these vegetable type proteins, especially alternative proteins that have functionality and, and, and characteristic to those specific feed, specific feed rations. One of the things I want to throw in here real quick is focus on fish meal specific to the aquaculture market, right? As we look at aquaculture continues to grow at 7 to 8% compounded annually, the actual availability of fish meal is, to, is, is, is less than 1%, which means we need to find alternative solutions to move away from fish meal, which has typically been the, the, the uh, dominant feed source in fish meal. We need to find alternative solutions. Spreading, who's one of one of the larger global companies out there in the fish market and in the fish feed market, 
you know, they've got a goal of getting down to zero feed inclusion. And uh, some of the trials that they've been doing, some of the stuff, they've been replacing vegetable meal at well over $700 a ton type value to, to be able to achieve that, that, that replacement of fish meal. Now, fish meal is well north of $1,500 a ton uh, because of the, 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 the demand globally for that as the aquaculture continues to grow. And really, that, and the next slide here is we talk about, right, all proteins are not created equal. Um, fish meal, because of the huge demand in aquaculture growth, and fish meal being the number one feed ingredient, has seen a tripling in its pricing over the last 15 years. It's gone from about six, you know, anywhere from five to six hundred dollars a ton to anywhere to, uh, fifteen to two thousand dollars a ton. Soybean meal has has doubled in that in that same time frame. Again, as that trend continues to move towards emplacement or inclusion of those of those vegetable-based proteins into the feed rations. On the right side curve there, what this is really showing is that premium for the for for those higher functionality protein products. The lower curve there really is basically your commodity-based proteins. As you move up the curve in terms of protein content, you move, you move up in value. So as you start low on the end with DDG and move up to corn gluten meal, et cetera, et cetera, right, you follow a fairly linear uh, tra uh, a protein value curve. What that red line above it is, those are, that is really the functionality improvement of, those, of certain characteristics, certain protein products you know, similar protein content, but they've had functionality added to them, right? And in this case, like MSC, like the Still Pro 50 product, it's a combination of corn gluten meal and brewer's yeast. And that gives it a, bunch, a much higher functionality, gets it a higher inclusion rate. It brings a lot more value to, the, to, to various feed rations. The next slide really just, this slide is, is to get to the point around how, how when you look at specialty proteins, you look at, there's, there's a wide swath of, of pricing and positioning within the various feed rations, right? Ruminants pretty much on your low end from a feed market, pet foods on the high end from a value curve. What we're showing here is you can see Still Pro 50, given the extensive feeding tests we've done and trial work, we know we can position across that whole spectrum because of the functionality and uniqueness of the product. Now, the, when you look at it though, right, we know that it can go, it goes into pet food and aquaculture, and those are your premium markets right, but it also can go into the ruminant market. What this is showing here, this is some other products in the marketplace. What that means is those, those other products are very limited to their market opportunity. The beauty of Still Pro 50 is it, it, there is an endless market opportunity because it can go across multiple species into multiple feed rations within the species. All right, so we always get the question um, when we're out presenting and talking about MSC and uniqueness, we always get the question of, well, what happens if, you know, 10, 15, 20 plants put in this MSC technology? You know, does that saturate the entire marketplace? Well, this slide really, what it's showing here is this is just a U.S. focus only slide. On the left-hand side, the total feed demand or feed market opportunity in the U.S. is about 140 million metric tons. If we sit there and say, okay, still Pro 50 at, at, an, op at an optimum case down the road, we get a 10% inclusion rate across that feed market. Right? That's equivalent to about 15 million metric tons of uh, feed potential to, 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 for the U.S. only market. Right? If we converted every single ethanol plant, all 190 plus ethanol plants out there, put this technology in and basically converted all the protein we could into the Still Pro 50 product, that would only yield about 8 million metric tons. So even if we converted every single ethanol plant, we are still short in the U.S. alone 5 million metric tons. All right. From a global perspective, the U.S. feed demand is less than 30, I think, less than 40 percent of the total feed demand. So the point here is there is endless opportunity and then this growth potential because that's these are using stagnant numbers. You add on that five to seven percent growth over the next five to 10 years. And these numbers obviously get substantially higher. All right. The next slide really talks about comparing proteins, comparing the Still Pro 50 product to other known commodity-based proteins out there. The chart really is getting at basically the, the equivalence of, of soybean, soy concentrate, corn gluten meal, MPL50 is a, is a high protein uh, product out of, out of a corn mill, brewer's yeast, and fish meal. And really when you look at that, right, because still Pro 50 is a combination of roughly 75% corn gluten meal, 25% yeast, 
It's got a lot higher energy value and amino acid, and Scott will get into that in a little bit here. But when you just look at it from a blending perspective, when you look at those other products and product values that it consists of, this product easily is a $700 ton type value into the feed ration. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit about the feeding trial results and, and where we're at. So what does that mean to that in from a potential point of view, where are we at today in reality? So, um, so this chart is actually provided to us from CHS, who's one of the marketers for this product for the UWGP facility up in Friesland, Wisconsin, who have been running for about 18 months now, the technology. The beauty of this slide is, is this is this is raw data. This is live off the printing press, so to speak, as of, as of a day ago. You know, the product is commanding a premium over soybean meal. So it isn't a if we can do this, if we can achieve this. This is we are doing this. We are getting this value. And so when you look at it relative to DDGS today, this whole conference is, or this whole session is about upgrading your DD, you're upgrading your, your, your opportunity, enhancing your market value. You know, you're looking at a well north of $250 a ton uh, in terms of this price over, over, over DDGS today. And, and so basically, still been A plus Pro Yeast, by the way, is, is CHS marketing name. Um, we use Still Pro 50 just as an internally. We don't use it as a branding name or to the market name. Uh, but A plus Pro Yeast is CHS is, is, is version of the product here. That's why that's on there. That's what the chart is at the bottom when you see those curves. So that 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 yellow line right is the is the traditional soybean uh, meal price or bean price. The green line shows the trend over time how we've narrowed that gap down and expanded that price. And a lot of that is driven by the marketing effort. The, the, the efforts that Scott uh, will talk about sh shortly here, the efforts of CHS and others in terms of really positioning this product as a true unique alternative into the, uh, you know, to, the, to replace soybean meal, to be an alternative to other, other types of products and other types of uh, lower value or, or, or hard to find fish meals and things like that. So, I mean, you're looking at realistically about a $400 price today of that product, whereas DDG, some plants are getting 120, maybe 130, 40 if you're, if you're lucky. That's the game changer here with the technology is we are doing this, we are achieving this. So in summary, when I look at the you know, bottom line, you know, what's going on about the global protein, the value, things like that, there is a shortage. There is a shortage of high value, high quality proteins out there, vegetable based proteins. Still Pro 50 meets almost all those definitions from a high density, nutrient dense, 50 plus percent protein. It's, it's benign, in other words, it doesn't have any anti-nutritional factors like soybean meal. High quality amino acids, it's high in lysine and other key limiting amino acids, and it has high digestibility because of the process, processing aspect of it, which John will talk about in a little bit. All right, you're really looking at today marketplace, we are not getting the value out of DDGS, right? We are leaving a tremendous amount of value in that product. And that's no different than what the wet mills looked at here 20, 30 years ago, right? They did the same thing and said, hey, we're not getting the value we need. We need to continue to, to pull apart and upgrade and, and enhance the concentration of those, in, of those various components of the kernel. And that's really what this technology has, has evolved from was that wet mill uh, concept and idea of how do we continue to enhance the, those co-products and diversify the revenue streams for the ethanol plants? We want to move away from basically legislative-driven revenue, right, and move towards market-driven revenue. And that's what this product and, and technology really allows pl plants to do. The last thing really on the protein side, it, it, we have, we've done extensive feeding trials. We know how this product works anywhere from shrimp to trout to tilapia to cows to pigs to baby pigs to turkeys to, to chickens. Um, and and it, it constantly comes back as, as a high-performing, high-value, nutrient-rich pro, uh, product. And Scott will chat a little bit more about that. So bottom line is we have multiple of these products installed today. We're producing roughly 60,000 60, metric tons today. We'll be doubling that with the Flint Hills project coming on, and we'll be doubling that again next year. Uh, and, and, and moving forward. Thank you very much. 
Great. Thank you, Neil. Um, I want to take this opportunity to remind everyone, all of our attendees, that you can go ahead and submit questions at any time during the presentations. We do have a couple so far, so keep those coming in. Our next speaker is Scott Tilton. He's the manager of nutrition services for Flint Hills. When you're ready, go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Fluid Quit team for the opportunity to present here today as well. Uh, as Neil has mentioned, we're the third North American installation uh, currently working on finishing off our, uh, our Fairmont, Nebraska construction process to produce uh, uh, product using the MSC technology. You'll see throughout my presentation, I'm using the NextPro name rather than the, rather than the uh, StillPro50 name. Uh, that is just our branded uh, approach to the marketplace and one that we've been out trying to get in front of customers uh, globally, including, uh, you know, as Neil mentioned, uh, a lot of work in Southeast Asia. I was actually there uh, two weeks this past month uh, trying to visit with customers and potential customers for the product, as well as um, uh, presenting at a conference in, in Taiwan. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm having a di difficulty there. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, one of the things we looked at as we started visiting with uh, with the Fluid Quip team uh, roughly, what, three and a half years ago, uh, was we needed to understand the value of the product if we were going to be installing uh, the technology. Uh, so we worked with Fluid Quip and kind of said, uh, you know, we need a lot of data here to help understand where we where we think species-wise it needs to fit uh, and have partnered with FluidQuip on some of this research. We've done some of it on our own. FluidQuip's done some of it on their own. But ultimately, uh, today we've got research data covering everything from dog and cat food to the aquaculture information that Neil was talking about to uh, the poultry world, as well as swine and potentially some dairy bypass protein applications. Uh, I'm only going to be presenting a short snapshot of some of that information today and in that we're a little time limited, but it, it was certainly something as we looked at the process we needed to understand and be willing to move forward as to understanding the value of the product across multiple species areas. So with that, what is NextPro? Uh, we're looking at this as a 50% protein product. Uh, it's one that's going to contain, you know, almost to almost twice the level of lysine that corn gluten meal contains today, as well as containing uh, much more methionine than, than soybean meal as a potential ingredient. The other neat part about the product that we learned as we started doing some of the research was that uh, um, as, as a protein product, it contains uh, about a third more energy in terms of the broiler than what soybean meal does as well. All of this, but at the same time, concentrating the yeast content into uh, into the product. So the product is roughly 20 to 25 percent yeast, uh, with the remainder being essentially an ethanol plant's uh, equivalent of trying to make corn gluten meal. So with that, uh, a very high nutrient content, very in interesting nutrient profile, and one that we felt was uh, worth uh, kind of moving into the next step. And as, as Niels mentioned, I'm going to try and share some of that research uh, that we've done with the product and ultimately research that is going to show the value and use of the product, replacing some of the higher cost ingredients that Neil mentioned, whether that's the Cargill corn protein concentrate product or whether that's uh, uh, fish meal or um, other applications in terms of some special feed applications as well. But with that, um, you know, one of the first studies that we conducted with, and we've actually done several additional rounds with this just to look at plant to plant and time to time variability in, in the product and have been very impressed with the consistency of the product over time is the um, you know precision fed rooster digestibility assay uh, work that would have been conducted at uh, University of Illinois. And I think Carl Parsons has presented some of this data and other applications as well. But Really, the key messages as we looked at that information and that data, as we came out with amino acid digestibility uh, percentages that were very similar to soybean meal, and at the same time came up with a very nice improvement in the energy content of the product versus a soybean meal type application. And the poultry area is one that has a whole lot of promise for us as you know you're seeing more and more emphasis on these all vegetable fed diets, especially in the poultry industry today, as well as um, some of the other pr production practices that are in play. Uh, with, with that regard, 
uh, we just recently uh, got in some um, early turkey turkey uh, growth data. So we're looking at the first 42 days of life within the uh, in a turkey. Uh, so starting with a 66 gram bird at the end of 42 days, we were seeing birds that were fed four and eight uh, percent uh, Nexpro in their diets starting to have a, a, you know at least having a tendency to be heavier at the end of the, that time frame. Uh, by in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 grams, roughly, in terms of body weight, and at the same time being more efficient in the process. So going from a 166 to a 161 feed conversion. So very nice improvements in 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 both growth and efficiency in the birds in terms of diets that were containing um, you know reasonable levels of Nexpro in into those uh, into those starter diets for these birds. Swine, we used a very similar approach in that, uh, you know, first thing to understand is what is the digestibility of the ingredients so you know how to formulate diets because our swine industry, uh, you know, in, domestically for sure, in most cases globally, are now looking at standardized ileal digestibility values as to how they formulate diets and are certainly looking at metabolizable energy values, if not net energy values, in terms of how they how they formulate energy content of those diets. So having that piece of information is the first step to really go out and talk to those customers and really came back very, very similar as well as typically you would see the pig is much better able to utilize energy from a feed ingredient than what the what the chicken is, uh, but typically also is going to be slightly poorer in terms of protein digestibility than what the chicken is. But I would say these are still very solid digestibility values for for use in swine applications. And the research we've done with the with the pig at, after that point is really looking at that uh, ne neonatal nutrition area, looking at special the applications where you're utilizing high cost ingredients potentially to help optimize growth in, in the young animal. So uh, experiment we conducted here was looking at a 21 day feeding study, utilizing uh, freshly weaned baby pigs and Really, we're looking at this diet as a replacement of fish meal in terms of these diets. Uh, you know, it could just as easily have been the fermented soy products that are now much more popular domestically than than fish meal. But as we were looking at a a global audience, uh, there's still a great deal of fish meal fed into uh, swine starter feeds, and so we were looking more at a global perspective as we de designed these uh, diets to say. Yeah, you know, let's replace fish meal, realizing that the domestic producer had already used the fermented soy type products, the hamlet protein type products as as the alternative to fish meal. So it would be a, a similar uh, comparison in terms of use of data. We looked at it and went as high as 16% Nexpro, uh, trying to replace protein equivalency with what fish meal was providing. Weren't real comfortable on the swine side, but yet at this point going much beyond that, you know, to be able to go all the way up to 24% inclusion. Uh, but at, at up to 16% inclusion, replacing all but 3% of the fish meal in that diet, we were seeing equal growth performance in those baby pigs uh, during the first 21 days post weaning. Uh, that was true whether we were looking at body weight, gain efficiency, or gain to feed ratio. Uh, but certainly, you know, somewhere in that eight to potentially as high as 16% inclusion in the swine starter feed areas is something we would look pretty solidly at as, as a potential application for the next pro product. Um, as Neil mentioned, aquaculture is starting to be a much more rapidly uh, growing um, sped, or fed species that we're dealing with. Uh, if you look at that marketplace, that is a Southeast Asia marketplace uh, with little bits in South America and uh, and uh, Europe and Africa as well. But uh, the the major producers are in the Southeast Asian marketplace. Tried to look at three different species as we looked at this. So tilapia being kind of the um, more omnivorous species of species that's willing to eat a little bit more plant-based product than than others. Shrimp is kind of its own separate entity as a crustacean instead of a fish. And then tried to look also at uh, some of the more carnivorous fish species and used rainbow trout as our model for, for those species. But ultimately, if you look through the data, 
Um, what we were trying to do was trying to identify ingredients in those diets that maybe are higher cost plant-based uh, protein sources that we could look at as opportunities for replacement. So with tilapia, uh, we really chose to look at the corn protein concentrate. Uh, and from a research purpose, uh, you know, we replaced 8% uh, uh, corn protein concentrate on a protein equivalent basis. So used up to 12.6% Nexpro in, in the diets for these fish. And over the eight week feeding study that we conducted, we saw no differences in terms of, of growth or uh, feed to gain ratio in these fish in terms of uh, uh, performance, as well as no differences in survival in this particular experiment. So very, very positive results in terms of the Nexpro product and, and led us into uh, you know tilapia certainly being a potential marketplace for the product. Uh, it's, uh, second or next area we looked at um, looking at shrimp diets. Shrimp diets tend to be very high in soybean meal, uh, and especially ingredient-wise, the, the big thing they're still continuing to to carry through is, uh, in most cases, is fish meal. And uh, the researchers we were working with at Auburn were very um, very confident that we actually tend to feed too much fish meal in the diets of these shrimps. So we looked at trying to replace fish meal as, as a potential nutrient source in those diets and weren't convinced that we were gonna get 100% replacement uh, with the research we designed, but wanted to see what it looked like. Um, and what we were able to do is we were able to replace roughly half of the fish meal in the, in the diet of the, uh, of the shrimp in this particular experiment and still maintain final, final or, or the growth per characteristics that we saw with the fish meal basal diet. Uh, so 12% next pro or replacing 6% fish meal in that diet was something that was very attainable, uh, but we weren't really able to go much above that 6% uh, fish meal replacement in that particular diet. Final research project I'm going to share a little bit of is some rainbow trout research we did. Uh, rainbow trout is one of the one of the predominant species really fed in in uh, the U.S. Um, with a little bit of salmon up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, US-based production is pretty limited in terms of some smaller scale tilapia as well. Uh, and there's some few few newer species, but they're limited, much more limited scale today. Uh, but rainbow trout, we looked at replacing a soy protein concentrate. So once again, a very high value ingredient um, opportunity with uh, with uh, the Nexpro product. So we want as high as 24% Nexpro in the diet, um, replacing up to 16% soy protein concentrate in those particular diets. And what we saw was no differences in final weight of the fish. Uh, we did see a little bit of loss in terms of some feed efficiency at the 24% level, but certainly very, very competitive in terms of growth performance and you know, would certainly say at least up through that 18% inclusion of Nexpro, we see very solid, solid uh, efficiency values as well. So let us once again do a very positive out outlook in terms of potential marketplaces for the uh, for the uh, protein product from the MSC process. And in this particular instance, it was one where you know, comparing to a soy protein concentrate product, we were actually pulling about $100 a ton out of the feed cost of those diets with uh, with some of the anticipated market prices we're going to see for the next pro product. So ultimately, you know, from a from a nutrition summary, uh, you know, we're talking about a pretty high quality protein product that's about 20 to 25 percent yeast content. Um, you know, certainly the swine and poultry data we've got in hand and some of the limited aqua digestibility data we have in hand. We're very excited about the digestibility uh, of the product as from protein perspective, as well as the energy content. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, compared to other corn based products, that yeast content of this product certainly gives it some very unique characteristics, including the, the, the uplift in lysine that we see versus a corn gluten meal type product. Uh, we're targeting this really as to going into diets and places where traditionally as a nutritionist, we would have used some of the protein concentrate products, uh, some of the gluten meal type products, or potentially in certain applications, even fish meal type products as, uh, as opportunities to uh, incorporate uh, the next pro product into some nutritional uh, formulations. So with that, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of conclude and, and uh, pass things over to John Quick from the Fluidquip side. Certainly, any questions, feel free to submit or uh, 
or contact me afterwards. Thank you, Scott. Our third and final speaker is John Quick, president of FluidQuip. Go ahead when you're ready, John. Are you still on, John? Yeah, sorry, I'm uh, unmuted now. Um, all right, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So Neil touched upon what the market potential is of the product. Scott talked about what the product actually can do for the animals. And now I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the advantages of the process that once installed into your ethanol facility, you will see in addition to actually making a new protein product. So our technology can really be broken down into four basic parts. Uh, a fiber washing, a protein filtration, a protein clarification, and a protein drying. So the first step we do is we take whole stillage, and rather than send whole stillage to your existing decanters, we first send it to two washing devices. Uh, first step is a paddle screen. If you can envision your washing machine uh, with your uh, turned sideways, you put your whole stillage into it, the machine spins, the protein comes through the washing machine and the fiber comes out the end of it. That's basically what we're doing in these two steps. Now, half the protein comes out very easily. So we can use a very simple screening device called the paddle screen and remove about 40% of our protein yield. The other half is very difficult to remove because the protein is trapped within the fiber matrix. So it takes a tremendous amount of G-forces to separate that protein. So we use a separate device called our filtration decanter to remove the remaining protein. So in these two steps, we can literally wash all the protein off the fiber that we want, and we can actually create a clean fiber from the step. We then collect the centrate, which is rich in protein, but it also has oil and has all the solubles from fermentation. And in the dry mills, we like to grind our corn very fine for high ethanol yields and high oil yields. So we get some fine fiber. Now, this fine fiber reduces our protein purity. So the next step is to reduce the fine fiber. So we use a device called a pressure screen. This comes from the wet milling industry where we actually wash fiber. So we send our protein rich centrate over a pressure screen and we're able to remove the fine fiber from the protein centrate. The fine fiber does carry some protein, so we dewater it in a decanter. We recover protein carried with the fiber, and that's returned to the pressure screens to eventually pass through and enter our centrate stream. The fiber from the decanter, which we call our fiber blowdown stage, is around 42% protein. We then combine that protein with our clean fiber, and we make DDGS. So we're able to control the amount of protein we remove from the whole stillage or the fiber to enable you to maintain a protein level in your DDGS at 34 pro fat and then achieve a high yield protein purity. And we can vary that. We can reduce the amount of protein we're removing by reducing the washing stages, or we can actually remove more protein and get your fiber down below 34 pro fat depending upon your end market. So our protein yield can be ranged from as low as zero pounds per bushel to as high as 4.5 pounds a bushel. In the US today, most ethanol plants, if you wanted to achieve a 34 pro fat in your DDGS, you're looking somewhere around 2.8 to 3.2 pounds per bushel of protein yield based on your corn protein and you would still achieve a 34 pro fat in your DDGS. So the one key parts of our technology is, as we remove the protein from the DDGS, we do not devalue the DDGS pile. So we're inherently moving roughly a third of your DDGS pile from $150 a ton to a $400 per ton pile without devaluing the remaining pile. That's the key to the economics. Once we have separated the protein and we remove the fiber, we now have solubles. So we go through a clarifier, we remove the solubles, we concentrate that to a syrup, remove the oil, and then put the remaining syrup on your DDGS. The concentrated washed protein then goes to a protein decanter. We make a cake and we dry it. 
the centrate from the protein decanter becomes back set. So inherently, the technology is four basic steps. Fiber washing, protein filtration, protein clarification, and protein drying. With this technology, we reutilize your existing decanters, we utilize your existing rotary dryers, and we, we reutilize your existing evaporator. So there's no change to that part of the plant. So now what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about some of the process advantages on the MSC um, technology. So the first thing you're going to see is that we significantly increase the evaporator performance. In the protein clarification steps, we remove all the insolubles today that currently cause all the fouling and all the viscosity issues in the evaporator. Today, most of the plants are operating between a one to one and a half soluble to insoluble ratio. So you almost have as much solubles, sugar, lactic acid, glycerol, as you do to protein and fiber. As you increase this ratio, so you have more solubles to insolubles, you're able to concentrate the syrup to a higher degree of solids. Theoretically, with our new evaporator feed, we can concentrate the syrup at an ethanol plant to 70% solids. Now, physically, you cannot do that because you can't handle all the condensate. But as we increase the soluble to insoluble ratio, we remove everything that fouls your evaporator. So two things happen in your evaporator. You get less plug tubes per CIP cycle. We still recommend that you CIP on your regular cycle, but as you open up the top and you look inside, pre-CIP and post-CIP, there's far fewer, if not any, plug tubes at all. We significantly reduce the syrup viscosity. We increase your evaporator capacity by 20%. So your evaporator today, if you can generate 200 gallons a minute of condensate, we can now generate 240 gallons a minute because as we remove the insolubles, the protein and the fiber, which ends up going to our protein dryer, we increase the heat transfer coefficient. It's like taking a pipe that's uh, 180 degrees and grabbing it, it's so hot you can't feel it. And then you put insulation around it and you can hold the insulation all day. Well, the protein and fiber inside the evaporator actually acts as an insulator. It coats the inside of the tube and prevents energy or heat from transferring from the steam side into the syrup, therefore not evaporating the water. As we remove those solids, we take that insulation blanket off the tube, and now the tube can pass heat tremendously fast. So you get more capacity. We don't change the thermal efficiency of the evaporator, but we change its ability to transfer heat. So your evaporator inherently becomes 20% larger. Very important if you're looking at plant expansion or debottlenecking, if your evaporator is a bottleneck, with MSC, you've now the bottleneck the evaporator and you hadn't spent a penny on the evaporator. The other thing we do is in the evaporator is as we remove the protein and the oil, this removes everything that really causes an emulsion with your oil. So as you concentrate your syrup, you free more oil. Typically plants run between 32 to 36% solids on their syrup. As we talked earlier, we have the ability to go to 70, but most plants are going to run between 40 to 45% solids in their syrup. As you increase your solids, you push that oil up because the syrup is more dense than the oil. Therefore, that density difference frees the oil and, and allows you to have more free oil. As the oil frees in an evaporator, it want, oil wants to coagulate, it wants to come together. But if there's protein and fiber, it may hit the protein and fiber before it hits another oil droplet and it creates an emulsion. So as you remove the protein and you remove the fiber, you remove a huge amount of emulsion. So we typically can see oil yields at one or greater than one pound per bushel because we are removing the emulsion formation in the evaporator. As we discussed earlier, we also wash the fiber in many steps. As we continue to wash the fiber, we free up more oil. So with this technology, you will see an oil yield increase from 0.7 to 0.8 or wherever your range is in oil to one pound per bushel. So all our, all our MSC's technologies are doing one to north of one pound per bushel of oil. And inherently using the same emulsion breaker that you're using today at 0.8 because we've removed a lot of the protein and oil or protein and fiber, sorry, that creates that emulsion. 
The next big benefit of the protein technology is the reduction in dryer loading. Because we're now sending our protein to a new dryer, and our protein is required to be dried on a ring dryer. Now, when you dry on a ring dryer, the ethanol industry has this paradigm that ring dryers are bad. Well, ring dryers are, not, are necessarily not the best dryer for DDGS with syrup, but on protein, they're a very uh, a proven technology. Because you have no syrup or oil in the protein ring dryer, you have nothing that's a high molecular weight uh, boiler, so you have nothing to coat the inside of the dryer. So where you hear stories of ring dryers with DDGS and syrup, protein dryers uh, do not have the same issues because we don't have the syrup or we don't have the oil that wants to coat the inside of the dryer. We, re we move 40 to 45 percent of the evaporative load off of your rotary dryer and place it onto the ring dryer. And part of that reduction also goes to the evaporator. So the way we're able to reduce the load on the DDGS dryer is we send a protein cake to our protein dryer. Plus, by changing the soluble to insoluble ratio in the evaporator, we do 20% more evaporation. So between the two, 40 to 45% of your dryer evaporative load will be moved partially to the ring dryer, partially to the evaporator. So ring dryers are more efficient than rotary dryers and evaporators are more efficient than dryers. So net, no, your net natural gas does not change with MSC. You see no natural gas increase in this technology. So what happens when you take 40% of your evaporative load off your rotary dryers? Well, the first thing happens is your gas valves drop. The second thing that happens is your color comes way up because your temperature is reduced in the front end of your dryer. So if you're running 850 to 1000 degrees, you now drop that temperature to about 650. So you get what we call low temperature drying. So you're gonna see an immediate four to five point increase in your DDGS color. The other item we've noticed recently is that the DDGS doesn't have a, a typical DDGS odor because with MSC, you actually do see a syrup reduction. So we produce less syrup, therefore there's less syrup going on the DDGS, and you're not drawing it at such a high temperature, you don't get that burnt smell. So you get a, a better color and you get a less odor in your DDGS. Now, now your dryers will be running. Uh, the other big item on the protein ring dryer before I leave dryers is that because there is no oil in the protein dryer, and, and what happens in a, in, a, in a dryer is when you get air leakage from the outside, you have this hot vapor, you get all this cold air leaking in, you get condensation. The condensation causes water vapor. The water vapor hits the side of the structure or the ductwork. The oil then starts to stick, and then your product starts to stick. And then what you've seen in the past is sometimes you get fires in these ring dryers with syrup. By taking the syrup out of the dryer completely, there's no risk of fire because as you get condensing, if you do get some leaks and you get condensing within the dryer, you don't have that oil that wants to be at once condensed because oil at 200 degrees Fahrenheit still wants to be a liquid. So that's what causes. So as you take the oil out of the dryer, your fouling drops dramatically. So your risk of fire uh, drops dramatically in this, type of, uh, in this type of application with the protein. That's why the ring dryer is a very good choice. Also, the product we're making is competing against uh, a lot of spray dried products, which are light and fluffy, high digestibility, and have certain palatability i.e. dogs and cats have a certain feel in their mouth. If you put protein on a rotary dryer, you're going to make granola. It's going to be very dark. It's going to have an odor. You're going to have to grind it to make it any, to any type of a, a powder type material. With the ring dryer, the product is dried within 20 seconds, dries at very low temperatures. So you get a light, fluffy, very digestible. We're protecting the proteins. Proteins are very heat and stable. And when you apply a lot of heat to protein, you denature the protein and you inherently remove all the value. Your product could look nice, but the animal won't digest it and therefore it has no value. As Scott talked about, one of the benefits of our product was the high digestibility. That is really all because of the type of dryer selection we choose in our technology. The, the biggest benefit for, for plants with MSC is that if you're looking at putting an expansion in, you can almost expand your plant, add the MSC technology 
almost for the same cost as building the plant out as a traditional plant because the fact that you have to buy new dryers to expand you buy a protein dryer to dry a higher value product and almost all the other equipment is the same so when we look at plants that are expanding for an additional capital for the msc that additional capital to put the protein technology in during an expansion runs right about a year year payback. If you're building a new plant, you can definitely build a new plant with MSC for almost the price of a, of a traditional ethanol plant. Once MSC is installed, your rotary dryers now have the ability to do 2X. So if you're at 100 million gallon per year plant and you were to put an MSC, your rotary dryers now have the ability to take your plant now to 200 million gallons a year because you've inherently taken 40 to 45% of the evaporative load off the dryer. Okay, fermentation. Here is probably one of the biggest things that uh, we're really getting a better handle on, on uh, benefits of the MSC. So as we talked about, we remove the solids in your evaporator feed. We also reduce the solids in back set. So plants that are running 7 to 8% total solids in back set will now run around 4%. So what does that mean? That means the amount of unfermentables that are going around a circle in your plant literally drop in half. So now you have the ability to put in more starch into that fermenter because you're taking half the unfermentables out. So for the same for you could, so for lower front end solids, you can run the same titers. So what does that mean? That means today if you're running 33 to 34% solids in your cook tank and you're making 14% by weight ethanol, you can actually drop that to about 32 to 32.5% by weight and end up with the same 14.5% weight percent. Why? Because you are putting more fermentables into your fermenter. So what does that mean? That means your yeast is going to become much happier. So what you're going to see is your yeast viability is going to last longer throughout the fermentation. It's not going to die off so fast because it doesn't have the high lipids. It doesn't have the high fiber concentrations and unfermentables that were recycled in back set. If you, you can prove this today by just turning down your back set amount and put more fresh water into your fermenters, you typically see you have cleaner and healthier fermenters. The other thing we see is that by removing the unfermentables, you have a much more constant bricks to solids ratio entering your fermenter. So what does that mean, bricks to solids? Well, bricks is a measurement of sugar and solids. So if you can maintain the same sugar content for the same solids, you should end up at the same weight percent of ethanol at every fermenter. What we see typically at some plants is people monitor percent solids in their cook tank, but is the solids coming from the corn or is the solids coming from the back set? And if your back set is swinging from six to eight percent solids, your fermenters are going to swing from 13 and a half to 14 and a half percent by weight. So the cleaner you can get the back set, the more consistent your solids will be in your cook tank, which means the more consistent you will be dropping in fermentation. So you can see a nice yield uh, increase in your facility by just dropping more consistent fermentations. You do not have to add more starch. You don't have to change the efficiency of fermentation. You just need to be more consistent. As you're more consistent, you can now tailor your recipes in your prop tank for that specific um, fermentation titer and then really work on becoming a, a very efficient plant. If you decide to run higher solids, put more starch in your fermenter, and you want to increase your titers, you can take your plant from 14% by weight to 15.5% by weight for the same fermenter because, we, as we discussed, we can put more starch into the fermenter. So what does that do to the facility? The higher the percent alcohol, the less energy in distillation you need for the same gallons because most of the energy in distillation is due to the water evaporating the water. If you are more ethanol than water, water ethanol boils at a lower um, vapor pressure or vapor temperature than water, so you can use less steam to distill or evaporate the ethanol out of solution. So you can see a small, small little energy gain in distillation. Also helps with the small little debottlenecking. Okay. Oops, sorry. 
So the other big benefit we see is we are seeing about a 7 to 10 percent throughput increase throughout the plant. So how does MSC give you a 7 to 10 percent throughput increase? Well, first of all, it removes 40 percent to 45 percent load off your dryers. So now your dryers are twice as big as they need to be. It gives you an additional 20 percent of evaporation capacity. So evaporation is an issue. You can get more capacity. It removes roughly half the solids of backset. So if your cook and your fermenters are a bottleneck, you can now achieve a throughput increase because you can get more starch in through the same system as you could with the high solids and backsets. The only thing you need in the plant in order to achieve a 7 to 10% throughput gain is you need to have mole sieve capacity. And if you have the ability in your molecular sieves to push 10% through and make the same um, anhydrous alcohol, you can achieve that with MSC. It tremendously cleans up your plant. It takes out all the unfermentables that are cycling around, so you end up with a healthier fermenters and a much cleaner front end. You end up with cleaner evaporators, and what cleaner evaporators mean is low, lower chest pressure, which means lower back pressure on your mole sieves and lower operating temperature in your evaporator, which means less fouling. It increases oil recovery. As we pull protein out of your DDGS, your oil content goes up. So you go from seven to 10% oil. So we're able to take out another 0.3 to 0.4 pounds per bushel of oil and bring that oil content back down to 7%. So you still maintain your same pro fat in your DDGS, but you're gonna make between 0.3 to 0.4 pounds per bushel more oil, depending on what your current oil yield is. As we discussed, we decrease evaporator fouling. And the one big benefit is we add no additional water. None of our technologies across our portfolios add any additional water. So MSC adds no additional water, uses no additional natural gas, gives you a seven to 10% throughput gain, cleans up your plant and increases your oil and gives you between a 2.8 to 3.2 pound per bushel new protein without devaluing your DDGS. So those are all the big pictures, uh, gains of what you get when you put MSC to, into your facility. So as we talked about, we have this running since 2009 was our first facility that we installed this technology. At the time, it was ahead of the, ahead of the market. Tech, protein technology was ahead of the, the ethanol market today. Our protein, we believe, is the next corn oil. So what corn oil did for your plant in terms of revenue and sustainability, protein would be the next corn oil. The one thing, though, that we really are excited about the protein is that we're not coming to you with a technology and a new product and saying, here's the technology, here's the product. You know, Go ahead and market it. Let us know how that goes for you. We spent a lot of time and a lot of energy understanding the market, understanding what the product is, doing all the feed trials, developing all the technical data, and going out, developing the market, developing a cost structure. So now the protein technology is sound. It's running in three facilities, soon to be four. So we feel that the risk to the technologies is, is quite little. We understand what the facilities cost because we built numerous facilities now. So we have a very good understanding of the cost. And now we have a really good understanding on the market. And there is a market. There's a, so you can start making this product today and actually sell it to a market. And the market knows this product. They understand this product. And there is a price now that's established in the market for this product. You get the benefit of increasing your corn oil, which we all want to do. And the most important thing is we're making that DDGS pile smaller because at the end of the day, the most valuable component in corn is corn oil. So we want to maximize it. The second is ethanol. So you want to maximize your yield. Today, protein is trading at almost equal value for ethanol. And, event, and soon, protein will be worth more than ethanol. So you want to maximize your protein. The lowest value product you are making today is DDGS. So our venture goal is to make the DDGS pile go away. So that's MSC installed in your plant. That's what you can expect to see. And if you go to our facilities that are running it, you'll actually see the, the, the proven data behind this. Um, they are receiving all, they are achieving all these benefits. So I think that's that's the end of what I have to say. So I think we can now open it up to questions or if any other presenters would like to say anything before we turn it over. 
Thank you, John. Did we have someone else who wanted to make a comment as well before we get started with questions? Oh, let's get questions going. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, great. We do have quite a few. Um, so the first one here is uh, it's about yeast. It's a good one, and it's actually one that I'm um, curious about too. I think it would be good for both Neil and Scott um, if you both have an answer for this one. Are there concerns or potential advantages with the type of yeast that is ultimately included in Still Pro 50, um, specifically GMO? Scott, you want to take that one? Sure thing. Um, you know, at this point, from a feeding perspective, I mean, we've gone as high as 30% inclusion in diets in, um, in some of the aqua applications we've looked at. And from a yeast perspective, you know, shrimp especially, we've actually seen improvements in survival rates, which would be kind of a hint at a yeast-based probiotic response. Uh, you know, globally, you know, there is some concerns with the GMO word, which you know, Europe today, whether it's GMO from the corn perspective or from the yeast perspective, is a concern. But otherwise, you know, these these yeasts are accepted as feed ingredients, so no no concerns from that perspective. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So our next question, um, I think, would be for Scott again. Uh, one crucial concern we consistently hear from aquaculture producers is that the color of the DDGs can alter the desired pure white color of the fish. Has that been addressed in this process? The the next pro or, uh, M, or still pro product is still going to have some of the yellow coloration, as you were able to see from my uh, the picture of the product in my slides. Uh, there has been some good research done by the uh, U.S. Grains Council looking at uh, use of DDGS and some tilapia and carp diets that, that would state that, you know, as you get a, you know, you can still feed up to 15% of this product without call it causing discoloration. And the yellow content of this product is not going to be quite as strong uh, as, as what a DDGS product is. But that is, that is certainly still one of the points you're going to hear pushback from. Hey, Scott, one other thing, if I could add here, the uh, what we've noticed is is in our wet milling days we make corn gluten meal and it's very bright in yellow. That's because it's got a product in there known or ingredient known as xanthophyll. In an ethanol industry, the xanthophyll or what makes gluten bright yellow ends up being extracted out with the corn oil. So this product is more tan color because the xanthophyll that was in the corn protein is actually ending up in the corn oil. Okay, great. I think this next one would be good for John, but if anyone else wants to weigh in as well, um, please feel free. How is the flowability affected on DDGs with less syrup? Is it better or worse? So two things, the protein product has great flowability. It's very dense, so it flows perfectly. Uh, recently, we had a, a, a tanker car of the protein sit for seven days, and we were the end user was concerned that they would open up and the product wouldn't come out, float out perfectly. The one thing that you will get with this product is that the DDGS will lose density because what makes DDGS dense, part of the density, is the protein or we're removing the protein. So the DDGS becomes less dense. If you have low sidewall hopper cars, you will struggle to get full weight on the car. If you have high hopper cars, no problem. You can make the road rate road weight you want. The protein is mainly loaded out in trucks and you will you will meet the weight of protein on the truck before you reach the top of the truck. But your DDGS does become a little bit lighter. Flowability, we haven't seen anything dramatic yet. Unless you go into hoppers with very, very small outlets, then it wants to flow a little bit tougher. But as long as you're with hoppers with big bottom outlets or you're doing flat storage, we see no issue with flowability, but the density does decrease. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I think another question for you, John, have you looked into compression compression dryers for Still Pro? So compression dryers we have, but at the end of the day, the law of, law of thermodynamics say that you need 1,000 BTU per pound to evaporate the water. So with compression dryers, unless we can get compression up to 300 pounds, we cannot drop the latent heat of vaporization to achieve any energy benefit. So today, compression dryers do, do dry this product, but most of the drying comes from electrical. And today, most of the plants don't have the electrical infrastructure to support the electrical addition on the dryer 
therefore we're going therefore natural gas still is the uh, lowest cost drying solution for this product also this product does need to have very slow drying time so anytime that you're in a dryer for an extended period of time exposed to high temperatures and a compression dryer would require either high compression or high temperatures on the wall to drive the energy into the center of the dryer we feel that there could be some discolorization or potentially some denaturing of the protein so all again all our competing products today are either dried on a flash dryer or spray dryered all of which have very low residence time and very low product temperatures and that allows you to maintain the highest level of protein digestibility. So we have investigated the technology, but as of today, ring dryer is the technology drying of choice. Thank you, John. Um, here's a question for Neil. You mentioned that there's an installation of this process in Brazil. Is that at a, an ethanol plant that uses both corn and sugar cane? Uh, can I take that one? Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, John, take that one, please. Yeah, so, so yeah, I actually did that project. That was a, a joint venture between Cargill and San Juan, facilities known as SJC. It's located in Curinopolis, Brazil. And that is a cane facility uh, producing roughly 800 cubic meters per day of hydrous ethanol. And we installed the Flex. One of our, our technologies we do is we do Flex plants in Brazil. And there we installed a corn corn facility at a cane facility and we run corn uh, around 1800 metric tons per day during the intra safra and we run corn in the safra alongside sugar cane so the facility today runs 800 cubic meters per day of ethanol 360 days a year that facility has all of our technology it has the 50 percent protein it has our selective uh, grind technology, SGT, it has our fiber bypass technology, and it also has our front end oil to technology. So uh, Cargill being a wet mill realized the value of co-products, and with all of our technologies, we can get to almost the same co-product value stream of a wet mill. So they decided to implement all of our technologies, and that was installed in 14, up and running in 15, and they're actually producing 4.5 pounds per bushel of protein and they're producing a corn gluten feed because the economics there show you to go to maximum protein production and they're making a one pound per bushel of oil with with no emulsion breakers thank you john um has the improved yeast health and fermentation led to increased ethanol yields uh, again i'll take that one so uwgp has seen an ethanol yield bump we are not guaranteeing ethanol yield bump as part of our technology. Uh, two reasons why we're seeing an ethanol yield uh, bump at UWGP. Uh, first is uh, from additional fermentation time. And second, we believe is from, as I discussed, healthier, healthier yeast because of the higher viability. And we reduce the solids going to fermentation, so therefore we put less stress on the yeast. So a combination of the two has resulted in a yield gain, although we do not guarantee a yield gain as part of this technology. Okay, thank you. This next one is a point of clarification. Um, John, I think you addressed this a little, but we, we have an attendee who wanted a few more details on this. Do DDG's parameters change when an ethanol plant produces both DDG's and still pro, i.e., what would be the pro fat levels of the produced DDG's at an ethanol plant that is producing both? So currently the protein yield we're making today is dictated by whatever pro fat the plant wants to run. Traditionally, if you wanted to maintain a 34 pro fat for the export market, the still pro 50 or the next pro, the protein yield would be in the range of 2.8 to 3.2 pounds a bushel. And it really depends upon how much protein you have in corn. If you're eight and a half percent protein or nine percent, it'll vary the yeast of our high protein. Since we don't want to take a discount on DDGS, we've we've parked DDGS at 34 pro fat. And the resulting yield is 2.8 to 3.2. The economics, however, will tell you to make as much protein as you want, four pounds a bushel, and take your fiber to corn gluten feed, and you will make the highest revenue for the plant. So 
where the economics tell you to go and where the plants want to run typically are two different places today. But right now, your your DDGS would be 34 pro fat. Your protein would be 50% protein, sorry, 48 protein as is. And your yield of the protein would be between 2.8 and 3.2. And your DDGS yield would be whatever it is today, minus, let's say, three pounds of bushel of protein. And then minus whatever your oil yield is today, if it's 0.7, we would take it to one, so minus another 0.3. So you'd be in that 10 and a half to 11 pounds per bushel of, of DDGS. Hey, John, I also like to add a further point to that. This was brought up uh, several times with the UWGP facility up and running. One of the key points is they have never taken a discount on their DDGS value since they started running the MSC system. So we do not discount uh, the DDGS value at all with this technology. I think that's a key point to make sure everyone understands. Okay, thank you. Um, next question here. So you have a branded product. How do you hold your value against those producers that will treat it as a commodity? Uh, I'll take that. I'll take that question. Great question. Appreciate that. The key thing with the technology is uh, is with the marketers that we've chosen to work with exclusively on this on this product. With CHS and, and Flint Hills currently the, the the leading marketers for all new technologies moving forward. Um, the that the work that they're doing to instill the product definition and the product quality, and we have very stringent requirements of what the licensing technology, what the system in terms of what you can produce and how you can produce it, things like that. Because we want to ensure consistency across all plants making this product. So whether someone buys it from plant A or plant B, they're getting the exact same product. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of effort and time put into the, the understanding of the product and ensuring the, the, specific, the specificity of the product. And it gets ultimately back to the robustness of the technology as well to ensure from you know, plant A through plant Z, we are making the exact product and we are, we are keeping it as a differentiated alternative protein type product and not a commodity product at all. I'd like to add a little too, Neil. Um, you know, as one of the potential marketers for the for the product, Flint Hill certainly looks at it as we have a vested interest in this, uh, as well as the fact that we're trying to make sure we're exploring and, and and developing new markets for the product in addition to the the existing markets that uh, we've already identified for the product. So, uh, trying to continue to find new new avenues to keep moving product so that uh, that risk is as supply becomes available that we don't end up eroding margins. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, what is your AAFCO definition for the Still Pro Next Pro product? Scott, do you want to do that or you want me to? I, I've got that from uh, from the analysis we've done on the product. Uh, the 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 uh, next pro product is still going to fit under the distiller dry, distillers dried grains definition, and that was part of the reason why we wanted, went with the branded marketing of the product uh, as next pro is to uh, make sure that we're demonstrating the value of the product rather than getting lumped into a, a DDG type uh, mindset in terms of product value. Okay, I think this next one might be for Neil, but if someone else wants to um, chime in on this one as well, please feel free. What is the guarantee that the protein market will be there next year? Um, uh, not to be sarcastic, but it's probably the much guarantee is the sun will rise tomorrow morning. Um, when you look at the global markets and you look at the global demand, you look at the all the factors that are driving food uh, and 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 feeding the the six plus billion seven plus billion mouths out there, the all you know there is such a shortage of high quality high dense protein that really is is dry is driving the demand, and I think that the the real telltale is the the pricing of the product the fact that the continue to see the drive and the values pushing over four hundred dollars a ton continues to show that there is a demand for this type of product and that demand has continued to grow. Scott, 
can you talk about your kind of uh, experiences from your travels over the last you know 12 months and what you're seeing worldwide? Yeah, and, and that's a that's a key point. I mean, as you look at most other areas of the world, I mean, we we in the U.S. kind of think about it and look around. We say we have lots of soybeans available, things like that. But you get into areas of the world where most of their feed ingredients are imported, and you really start to understand the need and demand potentially for for protein ingredients. And one of the things we've seen consistently as we've traveled through uh, some of the countries in Southeast Asia is is there's you know opportunities for for new protein ingredients there that uh, would help uh, diversify some of their opportunities in terms of ingredient choices and ingredient markets. And so I, I look at it and see a long-term continued trend for um, increasing demand of, of protein-based ingredients as well as just an increasing demand in terms of, of total animal feed production over there, whether that's aquaculture or whether that's terrestrial species. And I'll add, I'll add to that probably one of the other, you know, telltale signs of the, of the product and the product demand is, is we know that the facility here in, you know, the facilities here in the U.S., Currently, they are sold out through August at a minimum right now, just given that the demand for the product. And currently, roughly 60 plus percent of that product is going export as well. To Scott's point about the real opportunity and the real growth potential in terms of these other foreign markets, in terms of they just don't have the the, the abundance of land and acreage to produce these proteins like we do, and we're fortunate to have here in the U.S. They're very, they're very susceptible and open, and, and they have to import these high-quality proteins, and they're looking for new feed ingredients. Okay, thank you. Um, next question here. How much still pro can be produced out of one metric ton of corn? Uh, today, our maximum is 80 kilos to 85 kilos per metric ton, with 18 kilos per metric ton of oil. That's that's our current guarantees. Yeah, but that would result in a fiber at around 22% protein. Perfect. Thank you, John. Um, I think this next one is, is a good question for you as well. Will mycotoxins affect the protein? Uh, I'll let Neil answer that because Neil's been studying that quite a bit in these plants. Yep, great question. So what we've learned, um, and as John explained before about how the technology really is a four stages of, of washing and, and, and moving protein from the fiber. Um, today in a base ethanol plant, right, there's basically about a 3x increase of any mycotoxins you bring in with the corn, essentially you're going to concentrate up to about 3x that level in the resulting DDGS. In some of the work we've done uh, initially, we're looking at because of that extensive washing and because most, most of those mycotoxins tend to be bound to the fiber. We do see a partitioning uh, of those mycotoxins going more towards DDGS side and a little less towards the still pro or the, or the next pro protein side. Roughly in a 60-40 split, um, more work is, is being done in this area to understand in terms of how do we, you know, could we further partition, can we further separate one of the key things, you know, further separate those, those mycotoxins, one of the uniqueness, though, that uh, and there's, there's obviously some research more to be done, yeast is a known uh, binding agent to be added to feed rations that, are, can, that do contain high levels of mycotoxins to mitigate the negative impacts of those mycotoxins within the feed ration. So there's further work we're doing where the level might not be an issue, because we have the yeast in the product that is mitigating any potential impacts to the, to the animal. I would like to echo some of what Neil said is, I mean, it, it ultimately it, it's certainly still a risk and still a concern as we look at products and, uh, you know, especially as you look at some of the higher end applications, the aquaculture applications, the pet food applications potentially for the, for the next pro product is aflatoxins are still a concern, but it, it certainly is one that historical data from the existing plants would indicate that there is a lower level in the protein product than there is in the the residual fiber product, if you will, or DDGS product. Um, 
And so with that, I think it, it certainly uh, and season to season risk, but it, it certainly it seems as it's a little lower level in the protein than in the fiber. Okay, next question. Will the plant produce the expected yields right at the startup of the MSC system? Uh, I can take that one. Um, we're currently we're looking with you're probably looking somewhere between a 30 to 60 day ramp up. Um, UWGP was our was our last startup. It was a, a little bit different layout. Uh, it took us roughly about four to five months to reach our production capacity at our 34 pro fat. Uh, obviously, lessons learned. They were technology number three. So Flint Hill will be plant four, uh, five or six are engineering today. So um, as we get more and more plants online, obviously the startup becomes quicker, but we're forecasting Flint to be up to production capacity within 30 to 60 days after startup. And I think the key thing there is the, is the protein spec out of the gate. Um, is the other key aspect that that we hit right away because of the because of the robustness of the technology. What's interesting too is I'll add to that is when you look at the protein product in Brazil and you look at the protein product in the U.S. here, there's there's a lot of similarities and you're talking two different continents and yet you can look at the two products and they're almost statistically the same, which is quite interesting. With regard to the startup, yeah, I would say uh, talk talk to us this fall. We'll let you know on the on the next round. But uh, yeah, that that's kind of the impression we've had as well as you know, short period of time, but not not immediate. Okay, thank you. Um, we are getting close to our time here, so I, I'll ask one more question. Uh, will the power consumption affect our efficient producer status? Yeah, I, I can handle that one. So we've been working uh, with a couple of firms uh, in this area to fully understand, you know, where the power consumption is because we do add electrical to to the to the net uh, bottom line with the MSC technology. But as John alluded to, the pro the NAC gas is neutral. What we have seen in the data that um, with UWGP specific that they still are they are still meeting their efficient producer. Uh, uh, um, um, you know, greater than a, or less than a 20% reduction on the efficient producer. A couple main reasons why. Uh, one is because that, that ethanol yield that we're realizing or seeing in the plant is, is one key aspect of it. Also because of the throughput gain, right? So your, 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 your carbon intensity scores are the denominator is ethanol. So if we could get more ethanol but not use more, more base electric in doing that, that gives us a better improvement in our in our carbon intensity score. We are actually actually we have a petition into the EPA uh, to basically try to get the the net result uh, excluded from the base ethanol plant. The net impact that that it has excluded from the base ethanol plant because we are upgrading, we are improving, we are making a completely new product. And so we've been working with eco engineers and, and others to look at the. The, the the value or the carbon intensity of this product relative to the to the higher value co-products it's replacing and get a better co-product credit uh, than you have in your base ethanol today and we have some some great data that shows there is a gain here and an improvement here because this is replacing fish meal this is replacing corn gluten meal or corn protein concentrate which are which are all products which have a much higher carbon intensity associated with them so there's opportunity here to continue to work in the in this space and something we are, we are working on with with the UWGP and others and as as it stands now the bot, the bottom line is is no it does not impact it as it stands today Okay, great. Thank you all for answering all of these questions that have come in from our attendees. We do have a few left. I will go ahead and forward those to our panelists, so those will still be able to be addressed. Another special thank you to Fluidquip for sponsoring today's webinar. And we're offering an exclusive discount for webinar attendees to full conference registration to the International Fuel Ethanol Workshop and Expo. That's coming up June 11th through 13th at the CenturyLink Center in Omaha. So if you call the number on your screen, mention FEW late, you'll get a $200 discount off of that full registration price. And we actually have several upcoming events that you should put on your calendars, starting with a biodiesel magazine webinar coming up on May 22nd. 
It's titled New Advances in Detection Technology for Biodiesel Impurities. That's at 10 a.m. and it is free for all attendees. And of course, the FEW coming up June 11th through 13th, co-located again this year with the Advanced Biofuels Conference with two pre-conference seminars that will both be held on June 11th, the Efficient Ethanol Production Seminar as well as Ethanol 101. So you want to make sure that you drop in on all of those events. A big thank you again to Neil, Scott, and John, to our sponsor, Fluidquip, and to everyone who tuned in today. This concludes our webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.